failure to tell your patient what is required of him may result in his removing the prop and asking questions. When the position of the patient is too reclining, saliva will collect in the mouth during a slow induction, irritate the pharyngeal wall and produce a bout of coughing. The prop may slip and the induction will be upset. If the headrest is not well under the occiput, the slightest downward movement of the patient's body will throw the head forward, ending with the chin on the chest position. Whereas the head should remain like this. The feet must not be allowed to obtain a purchase on the footrest, or if the patient should inadvertently develop opisthotinus from oxygen lack, the chair may be broken and your patient may end on the floor. A strap around the patient's chest will only hold him in the bad position into which he may slip. It must be so placed that it will prevent the twisting and slipping movement which results from crossing one leg over the other. The strap must maintain the pelvis against the back of the chair. In those cases where the patient will not tolerate a dental prop, a mason's gag is inserted in the early stages of induction. Open the mouth with your finger and thumb in the sulcus, or by the dental surgeon depressing the mandible with the ball of the thumb, whilst you support the forehead. Never attempt to prevent the patient breathing through the mouth with a heavy hand occluding the airway. Relaxation of the limbs is an unreliable sign. If tested before fully anaesthetized, the patient may struggle. And if anaesthetized, the muscular tone may hold the arm in the position in which you put it. Nor is the presence of dilated pupils and a squint an infallible guide. If the patient has not lost consciousness, doubt will be created in her mind as to whether you know when she is under. Oxygen lack should not be pushed to the stage of deactivation as a sign of anesthesia or the good position in the dental chair will be lost and the patient will complain of feeling bad afterwards. For half a century, the effect on bacteria of antiseptics and other forms of trauma has been known. Many of these produce distorted long forms by interfering with cell division. Similar forms are also seen when penicillin acts on organisms in sub-inhibitory doses. The effect can be well shown by studying Proteus vulgaris by time-lapse photography. This sequence, showing normal growth, is speeded up 700 times. The strain of Proteus seen here is inhibited by 10 units of penicillin. And we shall now see the effect of sub-inhibitory concentrations on the organism. Here it is, grown on one unit. Compared with normal growth, there is little change, though some of the cells may be longer than in the control. The dose is now increased to two units, that is, one-fifth of the inhibitory dose. At the top of the colony is one cell now forming a loop. Although derived with the others from the same parent cell, it is more sensitive to penicillin and will burst while all the other cells appear to develop normally. When the concentration of penicillin is increased to three units, the typical picture of long forms is produced. 
The cell in the center and the one on the left are unable to divide. A less sensitive group is growing in from the right-hand corner. Finally, here is the appearance on one half of the inhibitory dose, five units. The cells increase in length as before, but also weaknesses occur in the cell wall, and swellings appear which may burst, leaving only a ghost. The light areas in the swellings are vacuoles, and most of these cells are not viable. We'll take another look at Jimmy and see the field of contamination around him. Again, a few days have passed. Here is the discharge from Helen's ear, seen under ultraviolet light. A discharge like this is likely to impregnate her bedding and clothes. When these are shaken, some of the bacteria float off, attached to dust particles. This is the third method of infection, dust-borne infection. Let us look at some specks of dust under the microscope. These may be fibers of wool, together with particles of soap from a blanket. That is the commonest form of blanket dust. When dust is cultured and examined under a higher magnification, we can see the bacteria that it can carry. Dust in the air, because it floats and gets everywhere, is therefore a... It can settle on furniture and from there be picked up on the skin. It can settle on crockery, or on food. Here's a dog which was given 20 milligrams per kilogram of morphine sulfate half an hour ago and which now shows the characteristic effects of morphine. The animal's relaxed and very drowsy, though it rouses a little when disturbed. The corneal reflex is present, the pupils are pinpoint, and the breathing is shallow. To test the pain threshold, a syringe analgesiometer is used. With this, pressure is applied through a brass wedge, and its value calculated from the volume of air compressed in the syringe. There's no response here to a pressure equivalent to about 200 centimeters of mercury, whereas normally this animal would wince at about 90 centimeters pressure. Two milligrams per kilogram of nalorphine are now injected into a leg vein, and the clock is started. The speed and completeness of this change are quite remarkable, and in just over half a minute, the animal is off the table and running round apparently quite recovered. After two minutes, the pain threshold is found to have returned to nearly its normal value. Nalorphine, the morphine antagonist which has produced this dramatic recovery, was first synthesized in 1941 by Macaulay, Hart and Marsh in the United States. She can be put in her own bed and taken to the recovery ward. Although the blood pressure has risen, 
the patient is still very posture sensitive and will remain so for up to 12 hours. Therefore, during the return to the ward, the patient's posture must be maintained as it was on leaving the theatre. For example, the foot of the trolley must be lifted when going down a slope. All jolting must be avoided. Any steps should be negotiated cautiously and the original posture of the patient maintained. Especially careful nursing is needed during the first hours of recovery. Many of the foods we eat contain sugar and starch, such as pies, pastries, sugar, cakes, potatoes, bread, and jam. These are called carbohydrates. In the non-diabetic person, there is a balance between these carbohydrates and the insulin his own body makes to deal with them. Consequently, if more carbohydrates are taken, then the body produces more insulin to use them. And restore the balance. If after a meal containing carbohydrates, the sugar in the blood of a non-diabetic person is estimated at regular intervals of say half an hour, it is found that there is a sharp rise in the blood sugar and a reasonably rapid fall as the sugar is used up. At no time should there be a rise above the level when the excess is passed through the kidneys into the urine. This level is known as the renal threshold. If the body does not produce enough insulin, as in diabetics, then it is unable to use its carbohydrates and there will be a rise in the blood sugar with an overflow into the urine, the scales, being weighed down on the side of carbohydrates. If you were to test your urine, there would be a strong sugar reaction. This happens in the uncontrolled diabetic. It is usual in the blood sugar chart to find a steep rise after a meal. Even when controlled, there is often a trace of sugar in the urine. But when insulin is taken by those who need it, the level rapidly falls. The sugar is used up and the balance between insulin and carbohydrates is restored. Many diabetics do not have to take insulin. Now, doctor, on direct examination, you stated that you performed a general physical examination of the plaintiff in your office in November or December of last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you be a little more specific, please? What was the exact date of the examination? Well, I, I don't... I don't recall exactly. Uh, I guess it must have been, uh, in December. Could you, uh, could you tell the court, please, how long it took you to make your examination? Oh, an examination of this type usually takes me about, uh, 20 minutes. I see. Now, doctor, you stated that in examining the patient, you measured his legs, and you found that the right calf was one half inch smaller than the left calf. Mm. That is what you said, isn't it? Exactly. Now this a half inch variation, doctor, would you say that that is a normal variation that you might find in any person? Possibly. Oh, come now, doctor. <laughs> I think that the jury and the court deserve a more positive answer. This half-inch variation, is that a normal variation? Yes, it is. Thank you, Doctor. Now, you also spoke of spasticity of the muscles along the spine. Could you tell us what exact muscles were involved? Uh, the erector spinae muscles, Mr. Taylor. 
Dr. Phillips, is it possible to state with medical certainty that an intervertebral disc has been ruptured solely on the basis of a clinical examination? Well, to some extent, you can make clinical tests which will indicate that certain pathology please, is present. Please, and please, doctor, that, that doesn't answer my question. What I asked you was whether it is possible to state with reasonable medical certainty that an intervertebral disc has been ruptured solely on the basis of a clinical examination. Well, no, not absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. Now, could you tell us the specific nature of your examination of the lower back of the plaintiff, what it consisted of? I prefer performed all the tests required in such a case. I assume that that included the Goldthwait test? I presume so. And the Lissac test? Well, for such details, uh, I couldn't say. Uh, well, how about the Genslin or the Faber test? No, well, for such detailed information, I would have to consult my records. Oh, that'll be fine, Doctor. Go right ahead. I, I don't seem to have them with me. You, you were aware, Doctor, weren't you, that you'd be called upon to testify today? Yes. Have you extensive records in this case? I keep and I have always kept a complete record of all my examinations and the results. Did you show your records in this case to the plaintiff's attorney before appearing in court today? I didn't. And yet you failed to bring them with you today? Well, I, I didn't think they would be necessary. Must be something phony about this. If he's got the records and he shows them to the other lawyer, Doctor, why doesn't he bring them? I presume that you have an extensive practice. Yes, I would say that. Well, considering your large practice, is it possible for you to remember all the details of your examinations? Well, certainly not. Considering your large practice, doctor, is it not possible that you do not recall accurately your examination or your findings in this case? That is not so. I reviewed the necessary records yesterday. Splendid. Now that you've refreshed your memory, perhaps you can tell us the results of the Goldsway test. Well, to the best of my recollection, the results were... Yes, go on. You just have to take my word as to this man's condition. Well, how about the Genslin or the Faber or the Lasek test? I've already answered that. And what was your answer to that? I doctor? told you that I don't recollect the results. You're badgering me to answer questions that you, you know I, 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 I don't know the details of. In the small veins of the mesentery, there's no doubt that the flow of the blood is streamlined or laminar. Look at the behavior of a dye which is injected into a tributary vein. It keeps to one side of the larger vein, remains as a distinct stream, and it doesn't mix with the rest of the blood. But what of the larger vein? Here is a single stream of dye running along the inferior vena cava in the abdomen of a rabbit. And it too is quite distinct, but you will notice that it oscillates slightly. This is due to the respiratory movements, which are small in this part of the body. But in the chest, these movements are much larger, their effect is greater, and here the flow pattern is very disturbed. So clearly, before we can generalize about the other veins, we must first examine the physical conditions which determine whether the flow is streamlined or not. Streamlines can easily be demonstrated with water and dye in a glass model. And here we have a pattern very similar to the one we saw in the mesenteric veins. Here's the same thing in a straight tube. With this type of flow, the fluid particles are all moving in layers or laminae, 
parallel to the sides of the tube. The viscosity of the liquid produces a variation in velocity across the tube, and this ranges from zero in the boundary layer to a maximum along the axis of the tube, the so-called axial stream. The profile of the velocities becomes a parabola, and the mean velocity in the tube is half the axial velocity. In the glass model, the long drawn out flow parabola is outlined by the advancing die. When the velocity of laminar flow is gradually increased, the flow first of all becomes unstable and then rapidly turbulent. Now all the fluid particles are moving irregularly and dye and water are thoroughly mixed. The velocity is almost the same right across the tube. Velocity, tube diameter, density and viscosity all determine the type of flow. And in 1884, Osborne Reynolds worked out this relationship between them for water flowing in pipes. This gives a figure, the Reynolds number, the critical value of which is 2,000. Above that, the flow is turbulent. Below, it is laminar. 